Well, good morning. Uh, we are so glad that you're with us. A happy uh, belated Thanksgiving. We trust that everything was well. Anything that was not well, the Lord is with us. Amen. So, we have uh, more than a couple of announcements today. Some of them are on repeat, so if you heard it last week, you can choose to tune out, I suppose, or listen closer for more detail. I'm going to read them because uh, there's a lot of good details in here. So, um, we have a Build a Blanket Serve event opportunity coming up on December 3rd. We'll start around 1 p.m. here at Oak Bend Church. We are going to build fleece blankets for a local nursing home. Uh, just lap blankets so they can stay warm uh, during the winter. If you're interested in being a part of this, I know a few of you have already emailed Pastor Dustin at oakbend.org. Um, you can also send me a text or catch me in the hallway, whatever is your preference, and we'd love to have you be a part of that, 1 p.m. on December 3rd. That same day, December 3rd, we also have another surf project starting in kind of the late morning time. Uh, Corey Brown's going to lead that for us. Uh, we're doing a, a complete ceiling repair project for, for a neighbor here in Toledo. We need about five or six volunteers. I think I have about two or three um, signed up so far, so appreciate that. If that's something that you're available and would like to be a part of, we'd love to have you join us. Just, again, reach out to myself or Corey Brown. We do have Christmas Open House, which we love, and that is on Sunday, December 11th, from 4 to 7 p.m. at Oak Bend Church. Uh, please, if you're going to come, just bring an appetizer or dessert to share, and come and go as you please. And we'd love to see you and spend some time with you. And lastly, in case you weren't here last week, we kicked off uh, a Bless the Nest for this Christmas, uh, a special Christmas project called Bless the Nest starting uh, last week, but you can get in there today, taking an ornament from the lobby Christmas tree to bless the nest in Bowling Green. Uh, the ornament will have the name of a family and a gift or some other item the nest has requested on behalf of the family. The ornaments consist of gifts in different price ranges. So taking the ornament means you are committing to supply that gift for the nest. Uh, just place the wrapped gift under the tree in the lobby once it's ready. Uh, make sure you put the family's name on the gift and the deadline for bringing the gifts to Oak Bend is Sunday, December 18th. So you have a little bit of time. Also, if you notice, if you grab something and it doesn't have a family name, um, that's fine too. There are some of those on the tree. We, those were added recently. Just, uh, those are just general gifts that the, the nest needs for themselves as well. So you can bless them in that way also. So we'd love for you to be a part of that. If you're able, a ton of those were taken last week. There's more. So if you had so much fun, you want to grab another one, great. If you didn't have an opportunity, you want to let, take the chance to do so after service, that would be amazing as well. I can't wait to see the presents start piling up under that tree. It's going to be a great blessing. Well, with all that said, uh, if you would stand and let's pray and praise our great God. Father in heaven, we love you. We didn't always love you. There was a time we, we maybe squandered in darkness, didn't know who you were, but you drew us near. Maybe from the, the prayers of a neighbor or a friend or a family member. But now we are glad and so overjoyed to be called your children, separated previously by our sin, but redeemed by the blood of your son, Jesus. And for that, we are grateful. For that, we sing praise this morning, for the way that you have saved us, pulled us up from the pit, and for the way that you set us on a path of life with you, your kingdom here on earth, your family of believers, gathered together on a morning like this to praise your great name. We are so joyful this morning. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
dark addiction starts to break Declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus Your name is power Your name is healing Your name is life Break every stronghold Shine through the shadows Burn like a fire church and we are here to worship Jesus this morning that's who we focus on when we come here on Sunday mornings is to be the center of our lives and uh, we're going to worship a little more in music in just a few minutes uh, but this morning we want to begin worship uh, with a season of Advent and we celebrate Advent here I think maybe many of us are familiar with it uh, if you're not let me just say a little bit about it as we we start this morning uh, Advent is celebrated the four Sundays leading up to Christmas. It's been celebrated in the church for hundreds of years, and uh, it is a, just a way of focusing our hearts and minds again on Jesus, what he means to us, what he has done for us, and particularly uh, what we think about this time of the season, which is that, that great moment when God stepped into this world and became man, what we know of as the incarnation, God becoming human flesh. And that's what Advent is about, to remind us of that incredible mystery, but without that work, uh, we would not know salvation, because not only do we need a God to redeem us, 
but we need someone to be able to identify with us as humans, but being perfect, and that is who Jesus is, God and man in one person. Um, Advent is celebrated a lot of ways, but one of the, at least a couple of the things that are always usually in the celebration are what's on this table this morning, and that is a wreath and candles. And let me say just a little bit about them, why they're here and what they mean. Uh, the wreath is a reminder of Jesus's eternality. The wreath is circular. It, it doesn't have an ending. And it's just a reminder that uh, Jesus didn't begin his life in Bethlehem. Jesus existed before Bethlehem. Jesus existed in eternity past, but he stepped into time at what we know of as Bethlehem. And so it's that reminder to us of Jesus's eternality. And it's also a reminder to us of Jesus's faithfulness. Uh, we are not always faithful people, are we? And let's be honest, the best we do, uh, some days we don't do very good. And yet Jesus isn't that way. He's always faithful to us day in, day out, whether we're faithful or not. And that is a reminder of that constant faithfulness. The candles are a reminder of Jesus' statement, I am the light of the world. And Jesus has stepped into a dark world, became light, and a reminder that we are to also reflect that light in our lives. And then each week we light a candle, and it reminds us of something that Jesus brought us uh, in his coming. And each week we celebrate those and we think about those. And so this morning, we're going to do all those things, but we're going to start our time in Advent by watching a video that introduces us to what today's candle's about. So watch this with me. The night the angels came, announcing peace to those with whom God is pleased. They couldn't have broken the quiet land in a more unexpected way. Hosts of angels lighting up the sky, trumpeting the good news, shattering the silence with praise and glory to God. How else would a Messiah be announced? Except instead of riding the white horse dressed in royal robes, we found you on the outskirts of a crowded town, given the last remnant of space, wrapped in a leftover cloth. And the least regarded citizens, lowly shepherds gathered under a dark sky, were charged with the glorious announcement of your birth. This is the peace that passes all understanding, the promise of a different kind of life offered with shalom, freely offered to build bridges between our lives and your kingdom in the most extraordinary ways. Amen. Lighting the candle for us uh, this week is going to be Matt and Kim Rogers and their boys. So I'm going to invite them to come and light. Uh, the candle they're lighting today is the reminder of God bringing us peace in the person of Jesus. I want you to hear these words. They flow out of uh, the book of Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah. Uh, he will write about 700 years before Jesus appears uh, on this earth. But listen to what he writes. He says, for us, to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the greatness of his government and his peace, there will be no end. Jesus comes to bring us peace, peace with God. You can have peace with God today through faith in Christ, but it's, it's not just a peace with God. It's, it's a peace in this life. It's something that the, the video mentioned. It passes understanding, and I can't explain that to you. You have to experience it, but it comes in the person of Jesus, and then the reminder that what we see in our world today is not what's always going to be. Uh, we look at our world, and let's face it, it's messed up, isn't it? There's a lot of trouble and a lot of uh, a lack of peace, but that's not where we're headed. We're headed to a kingdom with a king that's going to bring us peace. So we have something to look forward to. Let's pray together this morning, and then we will sing together again. Father, we thank you this morning for the gift of Jesus as we start this Advent season. Father, help us to take the time to just mull over that incredible mystery of God becoming flesh for us in the person of Jesus. 
And Father, to be reminded today that one of the gifts Jesus brings with him is a gift of peace. We can have peace with you, we can have peace in this life, and we can have peace for what is ahead because you're the Prince of Peace and you hold all things in your hand and you are ever faithful to your people. Bless your people today with peace and then enable us to carry that into a world that desperately needs it. I pray and I ask that in Christ today. Amen. Please stand and sing with us.
Dear Lord, thank you that we could all be gathered here together this morning to learn more about you and just to worship and praise you. Um, thank you for the opportunity for our children to go upstairs and be able to learn more about you as well. Please just bless all of the um, children's workers this morning. Just please help fill them with your love that just overflows um, onto the other adults that they're working with and the children that they're working with. And just um, please open our hearts to receive what you have for us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Again, good morning, and uh, we are closing out our series uh, titled In the Public Eye this morning, and the next week uh, we'll begin uh, in our Christmas series. So let me give you the couple places we're going to be this morning, and then uh, you can find those, and we'll get there in just a few minutes. Uh, We're going to be in Matthew 5 today, and then we're also going to be in 1 Peter chapter 1. Matthew 5 and 1 Peter chapter 1. Read a story this past week from a pastor, and no, it is not me. Uh, This is not my mistake. Um, But he was uh, writing about um, one of his most embarrassing moments in ministry. And uh, as pastors, we have all had them. This, thank goodness, is not one of mine. But... um, After officiating a funeral, uh, this pastor was asked to lead the uh, funeral procession as it made its way to the cemetery. And he said, I got in my car and I started driving at the head of this very, very long procession. So he said, I flipped on my radio for the drive over because it was going to take a few minutes. And he said, as I began listening to the radio, I began thinking about other things, and I became preoccupied, I became lost in thought, and I forgot where I was going. He says, about that time, I passed a Walmart, and I remembered, I need to pick up something. (laughs) Yes. And so I turned into the parking lot. He said, I'm driving up and down the aisles, and, and a few minutes later... I I suddenly see this place that I can park, and I happen to glance in my rear view mirror, and I see a very long line of cars following me with their lights on. He said, it registered, I'm in the wrong place. He said, we just circled the lot like nothing was wrong. I led them out, and I made my way to the cemetery. I would have loved to have known what it was like when he got out of the car. But he said, I was just completely self-absorbed and forgot that someone, actually a lot of someones, were watching me. I thought about that as I think about our series that we're finishing again today because I hope that the series we've been in is a reminder to us uh, as a church that somebody and a lot of somebodies really are watching us. And we need to think about what are they seeing, in what way do they see us going? Does it resemble the ways and the attitudes of the one from whom we claim our name, which is the person of Christ, which is where the name Christian uh, eventually originated from? It, It means to belong to the party of or be a follower or belong to this person. Does our Ways and attitudes actually resemble that as a church. In fact, uh, just a reminder again of what our question has been for this entire series, and one I hope we won't forget after we close out today, but this has been our question, and it is, what does the public think when they hear or they speak the word Christian? What crosses their mind? Do they speak it off their tongues with a joy Or is it kind of like, ah, yeah, those people? 
And now, listen, it's a question that God tells us that we do need to think about. We've already seen a number of verses where God calls us to give thought to how we're perceived by an outside world. And so we've been looking each week at how does the Bible tell us to handle ourselves, conduct ourselves in the public eye. So again, while they won't always agree with, and probably many times will not agree with us on a lot of issues and matters, we do need them to agree that we bear the name well and that uh, we resemble the attitudes and the teachings of the one that we say we actually belong to and follow. And so again, each week we've been looking at that. Let me just talk about where we've been real quickly, and then we're going to get to where we're at today as we finish it out. But we've talked about life in the public eye means a couple of things. One, it means pursuing a good reputation, which basically means that we're to have biblical integrity in our lives. The Bible that we say we love and the Bible that we preach and the Bible that we claim comes from God and the one that we call people to live by, we really need to live by it ourselves because it looks really bad if we're telling people how they should be and then our lives are nowhere in that vicinity. It just kills our witness. So it's a reminder that we need to take great pains to make sure that we are reflecting what the Bible says. Secondly, we saw that it means bringing blessing Uh, progress and advancement to the secular kingdom. We are to be about not just our good, or the good of Christians, or the good of what we believe, but we're to be about the common good of people. And we're to care about other people, even though they're not like us, they don't believe what we believe, we should want them to do well. We should want to play a part in helping them to advance and grow. And ultimately, that gives us a better opportunity of sharing the gospel with them. Uh, We don't want to be known as thorns in people's side. We want to be known as a blessing. And then third, we saw that it means praying for and responding rightly to those who are in authority over us. It's not whether we like them. It's not whether we voted for them. It's not whether they're in our party. God doesn't say that. He simply says, look, the people that are in authority over you, you as Christians should be praying for them. Because one of the ways that God works mightily is through praying. The king's heart is in the Lord's hand. And many times that's how God changes things and people and situations is by his people praying, him working, he gets the glory. And by the way, you should be a great citizen. And the only time you have the right to resist that authority is when that authority asks you to do something that clearly violates the law or moral precepts of God. Then you can say, I can't do that. But even then, you need to do that with the right spirit and attitude. And then last week, we saw that it means being a bringer of redemption to others. This is just a reminder. Why are we still here after God redeems us? That's because God wants us to share in this ministry of redemption with others. We're not here to conquer the world. We're not here to take back America or any of those things. We're here to see people one to Christ. And when people are one to Christ, that changes the face of nations over time. So that's why we're here. Now today, like I said, we're finishing this out. And uh, this morning, I want to talk about what I think is a much-needed virtue uh, from us as believers. And so life in the public eye, number five, it means embracing humility in our relating and our responding with the public. And if you're not at Matthew 5, I want to ask you to turn there uh, this morning. This brings us to what is known as the Sermon on the Mount. It's the largest sermon we have uh, in the Bible that Jesus spoke. Now, it's broken up and in pieces in the other Gospels, but Matthew has a really full version of it here. It takes up three of the chapters uh, of what we know as Matthew. Again, it's the longest recorded sermon uh, that Jesus ever gives, and it's often really viewed as the defining statement for what it means to be in the kingdom of God. In fact, this is not a sermon necessarily to unbelievers. There may have been, quote, unbelievers that were there that day, but as as it opens, it makes it very clear in chapter 5 and verse 1 that he is speaking to his disciples. He is speaking to those that claim to be followers. And so what Jesus is doing is saying, okay, I'm coming as a king. I'm coming to bring a kingdom And here is what it means to be in my kingdom, and here's how you get into it. 
And if you know anything about this sermon, it's really a very ordered sermon. It's not just a, a bunch of things here and there kind of shoved together. The way that Jesus speaks it, uh, the way that he moves through it is very ordered because he starts with what goes on inside and then he eventually works on how we live on the outside. And we talked about this last week, but that's what Christianity is about. It's not just about turning over a new leaf, doing a little better. It's about being totally changed from the inside out, having God write his laws and his truths on your heart. And once that happens and you're changed inwardly, the outside tends to take care of itself more often than not. And so that is exactly where Jesus starts. And this is a deliberate statement by Jesus about a defining virtue for those who will take their place in his kingdom, come under his rule. Notice how he starts it out. Verse 3, it says, he said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus says, if you want to be in my kingdom that I'm offering you, if you want to be a part of it, here's the only way you're getting in. You have to become poor in spirit. Translated, you have got to embrace a life of humility. Now, that little sentence right there that Jesus spoke, that, that hangs on our ha- home sometimes on plaques. You see it on cards. But listen, when Jesus spoke those words in his day, those words would not have been well received. People would not have liked them. Uh, in fact, living in a Greek and Roman world, they would have looked on those words as weakness. It would have been considered disgusting to them to think about being humble because they lived in a world that was built on self-importance, self-promotion, personal rights, self-glory. The kingdom of me sounds a lot like 21st century, doesn't it? And I think that's why, if we're really honest, we still have so much trouble with these words of Jesus why we find them so hard. But Jesus says a primary virtue for those who intend to follow me is you have got to be willing to embrace and pursue humility. Now here in this context, when Jesus is speaking about being poor in spirit, he is speaking about recognizing that before God, you don't have anything to offer. When you stand before God, you lack. You lack. You don't have what it takes to be right with God. Yes, you may be a great person compared to other people. You may be a lot more moral than other people. You may be a lot nicer than other people. Maybe even the person sitting next to you. But God doesn't compare you to the person next to you or any other person God just compares you to him. And when it comes to that, Jesus says, if you want to enter my kingdom, you have got to come before me recognizing you are spiritually bankrupt. You've got to come before me recognizing that you are spiritually impoverished and you are a beggar. You have to come with open hands. Not what I can offer you, God. It's simply I bring nothing. And what can you offer me? That is the way you have to come in your heart, acknowledging that poverty and asking God for the riches of salvation that are found only in the person of Jesus. Now, for a lot of people, that's a humbling thing because we like to think of ourselves as good. And yes, I know I'm not perfect, but you know, I'm, I'm pretty good. I do good things. And God looks at you and says, you may, but compared to what I asked for, which is perfection, you are so far off. You can't get in unless you come humbly. There will be no proud people in the kingdom of God. There will be humble people. You don't walk in it, you stoop coming into it, Jesus says. But here's the thing. Jesus doesn't leave humility at the beginning of our relationship with God. It is the thing that then he intends you to wear the rest of your life, pursuing and learning humility. And you don't have to turn there this morning, but I want 
you to see this text of Scripture because probably nowhere does a text of Scripture speak about humility in the life of Jesus than the one we're just going to put up here and look at. It comes out of the book of Philippians, chapter 2, and I want you to notice what he says, verses 5 through 8. He says, in your relationships with one another, I want you to have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. He took the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. So it's not just that Jesus says, look, you got to be humble to enter my kingdom. Paul turns around and Paul will write, and now that you're in the kingdom, this is the virtue you need to pursue. Why? Because this is the virtue that characterizes the life of Jesus. By the way, uh, the verses that we just read, many think that this was an ancient song or an ancient hymn that they saw, sung in the early church, which gives you some uh, peek into the theology that filled their music, and the reminder that the songs they sung reminded them of the life they were to imitate and the virtue they were to embrace. And notice what humility looks like here. It says that Jesus, being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped or held on to. In other words, Jesus came to this planet and voluntarily surrendered his rights to live like God. He didn't surrender his rights of being God. He was God in human flesh. But what he does is he surrenders the right to live like God. He doesn't use all the power and all the authority that is his as God. He actually lives as a human many, many times. And he feels what we feel, the hunger, the thirst, the tiredness, the anger, the sadness, the tears. He lives like a human. That's a step down for God. Could he have taken the right? Oh, you bet he could have. He had every right to keep everything that belonged to him as God. And yet he decides to come and he surrenders it voluntarily. He surrenders his rights. That's humility. When you surrender your rights that you can take hold of rightfully and say, you know what, I'll put those aside for somebody else. Notice what else it says here. Verse 7, it says, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant. Lowest person in that society, servant, slave. What does the God of the universe do? Steps down, puts on flesh, and becomes slave, servant. The person who should have been served by everybody serves everybody else. And here's a real thing. What's it like serving what you created? They're not as smart as you. They're certainly not as holy as you. They're not as good as you. And yet, what's he do? Steps in and serves the very thing he creates. That's humility. And if you read the rest here, verses 9 through 11, it talks about how God exalts him to the highest place. And there's going to come a day when everybody is going to recognize who Jesus is, and they're going to bow the knee. So this Jesus, who is the maker and rightful owner of everything, steps into this world, and think about it, he becomes a borrower and a sharer of all the things he created. Jesus talks about having no place to lay his head, no place to go. He comes into the world and literally owns nothing. Borrows a stable, born to two parents, they're poor. I mean, that's a step down. That's a big step down if you're God. That's called humility. And see, the life of Jesus is nothing less than a life lived by that virtue of humility. Voluntarily surrendering rights to help others. Not thinking of yourself as much 
Thinking of others more to help them move ahead. Sharing instead of keeping and hoarding. Healing instead of hurting. Coming up alongside than just leaving people alone, which would have been a whole lot easier. That's Jesus. And what's the point of all of that? Well, the point of all that is verse 5 of Philippians. Notice what he says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Jesus. What's the mindset? It's humility. And he says, you embrace humility. Why would he have to tell us to embrace humility? Because it isn't natural. I know we'd like to think it is, but it isn't. We live in the kingdom of me, my rights, my things. That belongs to me. I want my comfort. Paul writes and says, exemplify Jesus by looking like him through the virtue of humility. By the way, just question this morning. Is that what the church is characterized by today? And I'm talking church general, not just here. Is that how people perceive us today? In our interactions with the public, would they walk away thinking, I don't agree with them, but I'll tell you one thing, they are humble people. Or do they see us more concerned with always what we think is our rights? Do they know us as contentious? Always have to win the argument. Always got to get the last word. Always got to prove our point. Even in our fight for what we think is right, have we become a people that's unwilling to listen to the other side? Hear another point of view. Try to understand where somebody is coming from, even though you don't agree with them. And even if you have to still disagree with them at the end of the conversation, would they say that we can do it without being disagreeable, without being rude, nasty in our tone, in our attitude? Jesus did. Jesus didn't sit with people like him because there wasn't anybody else like him. And Jesus sat with people that weren't anywhere where he was on the moral spectrum or anything else. But the Bible talks about his graciousness of speech and gentleness of character. That's humility. That's what he showed. There's a preacher uh, from the past, a guy by the name of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. He did a lot of study on the Sermon on the Mount. I I think it took him, I don't know, maybe a couple years to, to preach through it. Um, So see, my sermons really aren't all that long. You should feel good about that. Um, But I want you to listen to what he wrote about the Sermon on the Mount. He said, the world does not thirst for a religious imitation of itself. And we have it up here for you to see. He said, nor does it thirst for an us-against-them moral turf war with its zealous religious neighbors. The world thirsts for a different kind of neighbor. Not the kind who deny their fellow man, take up their comforts and follow their dreams, but the kind who deny themselves, take up their cross and follow Jesus in the mission of loving a weary world to life. The world also thirsts for a new vision for being human, for pursuing and entering friendship, and for contributing to a better world. See what that sermon he's talking about asks us for, which is that? You can't do that without humility. You just can't. The very virtue that starts this sermon off, humility. So just a question this morning, how's our humility showing in how we relate to outsiders? That should be how we relate inside this building but it's also how we relate outside. Now, it's not just relating to the public where we need humility. We also need our humility in how we respond to them. I want you to turn with me to 1 Peter for a moment. We'll finish up there today. 1 Peter 
Just want to look at a single verse here. Peter is writing to believers who are scattered out across the Roman Empire due to persecution. He is writing this letter to remind them how to live well in that moment and how to respond well to the suffering that they are facing and the pressure that is being put down on their faith. And in chapter 3, he talks about how do they respond when somebody from the public eye inquires about their faith. And I want you to notice what he says in verse 15, 1 Peter 3. He says, but in your hearts, revere or set Christ apart as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But catch this line, do it with gentleness and respect. Peter says, and he's not writing to preachers alone or seminary professors. He's writing to just average everyday believers. He says, I want you to be prepared to give an answer. And that word answer is where we get our word apology from. And he's not saying, I want you to say, I'm sorry. It's the word we get apologetics from. I want you to be able to answer people about your faith, about your hope, when they speak to you. Why? Because Peter's going to take for granted that, look, if you're really living and honoring Christ and you're bearing that name well, people cannot help but notice after a while, why is that person not like me? Why is that person different? And they're going to ask some questions. Now, there's two ways, I think, to view this passage. The first is from a friendly point of view where somebody watches your life they watch how you handle difficulties, how you go through pain, how you go through things that you don't necessarily like, but they look at you and, and they, they see you filled with a hope. They see you filled with peace and joy. Even when you're in the midst of difficult moments, you don't fall apart, you don't come unglued, you still have this hope. And you know what? There's going to be people that are going to look at that and they're going to want to know, speak to me. Tell me why you're that way. You're not falling apart, but your life's falling apart. You're not falling apart when things around you are falling apart. And he says, look, when that moment comes, just be ready to share your testimony. Be ready to tell them what God has done for you, how he's worked in your life. And by the way, the best apologetics, the best people who make apologists are usually just everyday average people. They are just living their life side by side with their neighbor and their neighbor watches and thinks, man, why are you so different? Share your testimony. Share what God has done for you. That's one way to look at this text. I don't think that's really the heart of it. I think the heart of it is what do I do when I'm living my faith out? I'm holding to godly standards and ooh, that just clashes with my culture. And listen, it will, it will. If you're not clashing at all with your culture, if you're not standing out at all in any way from your culture, you're probably not really embracing what the Christian life calls for because it's going to set you at odds in some places and points with your culture. And when that happens, there's going to be people that are going to look at that and one of two things. They're either going to be confused or they're just really not going to like the way you live your life and why you don't agree with things. Now, when that moment comes, what do you do? Well, you can get mad. You can scream at them and argue with them. That's not what he says. He says, be ready to give an answer. In other words, I want you to be able to talk about more than your testimony. I want you to be able to talk about your faith. I want you to be able to talk about the realities of your faith. Can you talk about the realities of your faith with a person outside these doors who doesn't know God? And what I mean by that is, can you just explain who Jesus is? Why is Jesus so important? Can you tell them, this is where the Bible falls on moral issues? Do you know what the people out there believe that you don't believe? That's what Peter's talking about here. 
And Peter says, look, you should be able to respond to that. You don't have to have all the answers, but you need to have some basic answers that I understand my faith. I know who Jesus is. I know something about the Bible and how we got it. And and I know some general things. That's what Peter says here. You need to know that. Every Christian needs to know that. But take note here. Take note here that what he really puts down his finger on is not how clever your argument is. But it's how you say what you say. And he says, make sure that even when people are not happy with you and they're kind of probing you and poking you, he says, make sure that when you respond, you do it with gentleness, that's humility, and respect. What's that look like? Well, here's what that looks like. It means that when you talk to people, your thought is, I got to bury them with my argument. It's not about winning an argument. It's about winning people. And by the way, I have never won anybody with an argument into the faith. I've never seen anybody win. I've seen people talked into it and and discussed into it and and, and gently led that way, but I've never seen arguments that lead people to the faith. And I see a lot of that today, and I'm sorry, I see it on social media. I see it in the news. And boy, the Christians out there just screaming their heads off arguing. That's a waste of time. And it's not very honoring because it's not done here with gentleness. And what's the other word? Respect. Oh, how's that one? Respect for the person who doesn't agree with me? Yes. Respect for the person that doesn't believe what I believe? Yes. Respect for the person that's way, way over there? You mean the pagan? Yes. Respect. Because God loves them as much as he loves you. And God died for them like he died for you. And you're not here to win an argument with them. You're here to win them to the one that won your heart. It means disagreeing without, we talked about being disagreeable, without being rude and spiteful. And here's one. Can we be honest enough with the outside world to tell them that there's some things that we just don't have an answer to? We really don't. Theologically, we don't have an answer to. But we feel like we have to answer everything to the nth degree. Listen, there's things we don't know. There's things God hasn't said. So when you talk to the unbeliever, just leave it at what God said. And when they say, well, what about this? Hey, I got a great answer for you. I don't know. And they'll be happy with that. Because sometimes we act like we know everything and God hasn't even said it. No, I'm going to get in trouble for that. It's okay. (laughs) And, and, And by the way, I'll tell you where that comes into play. It comes into play in morals. It does. There's things we talk about that we just need to say what God says and leave the rest alone. Don't add to it. Don't push more on it. We don't know. Just leave it between God and them. And I'll tell you what else this means. It means that when we talk to people, can I tell you something? A lot of people that aren't always happy with God, it's it's not... God, that's always the biggest issue. It's something else a lot deeper in their heart that's went on, gone on, and that's where you need to get to. And if you just instantly bring up your argument and you're rude and you're, you're just, I got to win this, they will never open their heart to you. And that's where you've got to get to is what's going on in that person's heart, which then allows you to tailor the gospel to that issue. And then they're open. At least they're a lot more open. And by the way, when we speak with other people, let's just be aware of our own sinfulness and weakness. Even as believers, we are terribly weak and terribly sinful. We can still fall. We still can do wrong. And so let's just be mindful of that when we're responding to people and sharing with, even when we've got to point out what God's moral truth is, do it with gentleness and do it with respect. It'll go a long, long way. So question this morning, are you able to respond to an outside world about your faith? I'm not asking you to have a seminary education. I'm just asking, can you just talk to a person about God and who Jesus is? Do you know enough of that to point people in the Bible to some things? Augustine, or Augustine, however you choose to pronounce it, uh, he's considered one of the greatest theologians of the church. 
he was once asked to list the three most central principles to the Christian life. Think about how you'd answer that. What would you have said? Here's how he answered it. Humility is first, second, and third in Christianity. That's how he answered it. Probably because it came from a man who was incredibly proud and arrogant in his days before Christ. And even after he became a believer, he didn't start off very humble. And he drove a lot of people away. Time, God shaped him, changed him, and he realized, ah, this imitates my Savior a lot better, and people are a lot more open when I'm humble. So as we we close out this thought about life in the public eye, hey, let's just think for a moment, guys, where, where is humility in the church today? doesn't mean we can't have a backbone. I'm not, I'm not saying that today. It's not saying we, we can't stand for what's right. It's how we do it. And it's the attitude that we do it with. And I think humility is the way to go because this is what's central in the life of Jesus. So my hope is that it will become that way in my life and in your life. I'm by no means... Um, there yet. None of us are. So think about life in the public eye. Let's make sure it's filled with biblical integrity, okay? Let's make sure that we are a source of blessing to others, not a thorn. Good citizens toward the people that God allows over us. Bringers of good news to people who need it, just like we did, and all of it. All of it packaged up and pursued in a spirit of humility toward those that are outside these doors. Father, this morning, Lord, we're not asking to agree with all that's in the public eye. That's not what you called us to. But we do pray to live well in the public eye, to reflect the life of Jesus well, the attitudes the virtues of Jesus well before a watching world. And may, may, we just, may we just live the faith we profess, love God and others, pray for those you put over us, share the news where you open the door, and God, may all of that be packaged up in a life that is humble recognizing our own sinfulness and shortcomings before God and treating others, even others on the other side, with gentleness and respect. Lord, may that be what we reflect to people living in the public eye, I pray. In Jesus' name. Please stand and sing with us.
Well, if you have a need this morning and you'd like prayer, I'd love to meet you up here. Glad to pray for you. Hope that you uh, have a good holiday as we start into the Christmas season, that you'll take some time to think about what God has done for us in the person of Jesus uh, over these next coming weeks. It's easy to get caught up in a lot of things and forget the main thing. Father, this morning, Lord, we love you. We thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus. Your word reminds us that your goal is to make us into his image. Uh, Lord, that's a, that's a lifelong process and then one that will continue into eternity. But help us to submit to it here. May our lives as the people of God more and more reflect the attitudes and heart of Jesus to an outside world, I pray. And even within these doors, may we show humility, love, grace, kindness, and respect to one another. Father, bless us as we head out into a new week. May we glorify you well. I pray and ask that in Jesus Christ. Amen. Have a good Sunday. Have a great week.